<laughs> At long last, the stream will be mine. <laughs> Now, your first task is to bring me all the fish. Follow them! And some prizes! Okay, I give up. <laughs> Hi, guys. Uh, go away. <laughs> Don't mind shark lore there. Just be filled with fear over the fact that Sakage just subbed, subbed again. Well, I can barely even talk right now. I am really tired, guys. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, Sakage. As ever, those Twitch Prime subs are very much appreciated. Thank you. Ah. No, no, no. That's not jumping the shark. This is jumping the shark. Ah. Why am I so sleepy? Well, there's actually two reasons. One, I was watching my niece most of the week, which, while awesome, is incredibly tiring. And number two, I was up... I didn't actually get to make it all the way to the end, but I was up watching GDQ last night. So... So... Trying out the new coat. Let me know what you guys think. This is actually a brand new coat. A new blazer. Um, it's a little weird around the shoulders, but otherwise it works a lot better than the other coat I have, so I'm relatively pleased with it so far. Mm, I need to get rid of this, apparently. That's easy enough to do. Snake pattern and eye patch. No. <laughs> How's your week been? <laughs> I don't even see what the total we had here. A huddy? What the heck is a huddy? Unless you mean a hoodie, in which case, screw that. <laughs> My look has been the sort of pseudo-professional look for quite some time. Ah, okay. Much better. Uh, this is a Ralph Lauren. I got it at a store that sells blazers. May or may not have been a little expensive, but you know. <sighs> it is a little warm, but I need to show it off, and I'll be wearing it for, for recordings anyways. The one only thing I don't like is there's way too much padding in the shoulders for me. Like, I don't like this much padding in the shoulders. I already have very broad shoulders. I don't need this to make my shoulders look broad. They are broad. Ah... <sighs> I don't have much rambling going on, to be completely honest with you. We do have a couple things to talk about, though. So, for those of you not aware... How's the music volume, by the way? I'm testing something else here. Romulan shoulder pads? No. Uh, for those of you not aware, we have this little thing that I'd like to plug called uh, Lore Walker Theater. I don't know if you ever heard of that. And if you haven't, then you make me sad, because... Damn it. <laughs> Whoops. There we go. Now. You've never. You, I know, right, Sildir? 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 Oh, God, where's my line? Oh, yeah, that's right. Actually, we should be down here for music volume. There we go. No. I mean, I could mention it. Guys, PUBG dropped their lawsuit. There you go. There's the news. I have nothing to say about that. <laughs> In fact, the only thing I have to say about that is it's. Pr I'm pretty sure that Tencent is the one who you know, came down and was like, guys, because Tencent owns a fairly large chunk. Uh, I don't actually know if they have a controlling chunk of PUBG off the top of my head, but they, have, they own, a decent, own a decent chunk of it. And they also own a decent chunk of... Uh... Oh, God, I can't think of the name of the company. The company that owns Fortnite. <laughs> so... 
what is seafood pizza? Is it epic? I think it is epic, yeah. I think you're right. Anyways. So, God, I am, I am legitimately tired here. I do have some topics for today, but before we get into those, I want to talk about Lorwalker Theater, because Lorwalker Theater is awesome. Um, Lorwalker Theater is a thing where me and several, several of the community members of the Lorwalkers, you guys, are voicing lines from a game that otherwise does not have voice acting in order to put it together into basically making it a theater version of a particular game. Now, we already did a game called Paper Mario 2, which was basically a test bed for the entire project. Um, the first couple of episodes of that are kind of bad because it's all me, as in 100% of the voice acting is done by me. But uh, later on, we start act adding in more, more and more people, and those people... You know, start doing, adding variety to the show. And I think it got really good, especially by the end there. Of course you follow me. They all do. Now, all of those lore walkers obviously follow me. But the, uh... Ah, words. The one we're going through is right now is Final Fantasy IX. And... Holy crap, I'm being filled with fear all over the place here. Hang on a second. Thank you, as ever, Jason Bauer. Please stop donating. Okay. <clears throat> and of course, I'm filled with fear because of Sildeer, who has decided to sub to me with Twitch Prime, which is awesome. Thank you very, very much, Sildeer. Uh, what the heck is sausage crust? I don't even know what this stuff is anymore. I, I'm apparently just out of date when it comes to pizza stuff. Anyways, so, uh, Lord Walker Theater, right. So we're doing FF9 right now, and I'm trying to generate just a little bit more buzz and interest in order to basically keep my people uh, active because I have, I've decided that despite my incredibly smashed schedule, I'm going to commit to spending at least one day every week uh, getting Lord Walker Theater stuff done instead of trying to do it all in one large chunk. So... Uh, help, do some, do more stuff. And I'm also going to do something else uh, really quick here. I'm going to do a live video reveal. Which is this. There we go. And published. So, a teaser for the FF9 Lower Rocket Theater just went live that second. Uh, when I set it up there, here is a link to it if anybody wants to go watch it. Uh, now or later. That's up to you guys. Uh, just a little bit of an idea of how it's turning out. It's not the best selection of scenes, but I, ha I wanted to pick scenes where all the lines were completed, and I'm missing some of Steiner's lines later. I'm missing some of Zidane's lines everywhere. Um, I didn't have some of Freya's lines for some of the later stuff, but so far it's looking really, really good. Uh, there are a few issues here and there, but I am very, very happy with a lot of the voice acting so far. We've got a ton of people involved. We could still use more people, by the way. So the requirements for getting involved, just really quick here, are you have to be on my Discord, easy, duh, because that's where we're coordinating everything. You have to have a decent mic and you have to be reliable. That's all it takes. Now, as of right now, most of the major roles are obviously taken because, you know, we've been working on this for a few months now. But FF9, for those of you not aware, is a, is a game with an enormous number of NPCs with speaking lines, some recurring and some not. And... As I've said many, many times, um, spending effort and time on those NPCs is something I'm very big, you know, I'm, I'm very much in favor of, right? Um, I know that sounds like a weird thing to say, but I talked about this during, for example, my Dragon Age Origins lore run, if you remember that. You know, one of the things that made Origins work so well for me is they actually spent effort on random NPC voice actors instead of just being some guys who's like reading a line, you know what I mean? So, NPCs are still very important, so I, I just say that because if I ask you to do a guy who has two lines, that's not an insult. Please don't take it as such. Define reliable. Um, if I give you a role, I want you to keep doing that role. In other words, I'm very against the idea of, oh, you'll voice Bob, and then three episodes down the line I need you to voice Bob again and you're not available. That's what I mean by reliable. As far as a decent mic, there is something called a Yeti Snowball, which is about $50, and it is a surprisingly high-quality mic, given the fact that it's that 
cheap. I know that's not super cheap, but I can absolutely recommend that, and that's one, the one I t generally tend to recommend to people. Uh, it's not what I have here. Uh, I have a Blue Yeti. Or, a blue, yeah, Blue Yeti, Yeti Snowball, I'm saying that right. Um, but this is more like $130, so you don't, you don't want to do this. <laughs> <sighs> so, yeah, the Snowball works great. I have several, several viewers... Uh, and several actors, I should say, who are using the, the, the blue snowball. I can vouch for its quality. It works great. I actually was willing to buy a snowball for one of my actors, but I literally couldn't because he lives in Russia. That's another thing. Um, I do. Uh, I guess that's technically my fourth requirement. I need you to be able to speak English. I know that sounds strange, but I mention that because some people have been like, well, I'm, you know, I'm Polish. I can't do this. I was like, well, can you speak English? Yeah, well, then you're in. I actually have uh, people from pretty much all over the place doing lines to help add to the, the flavor of it. You know, Sildeer has got this wonderful uh, Germanic thing going on. Uh, we've got this wonderful woman playing Freya. She's got this delightful accent, really adds to the character. You know, My point being, I'm not interested in just American accents. So, as long as you can speak English, I'm good with it. <laughs> you know? I mean, could you imagine FF9 if everyone spoke like I do right now? Although my accent tends to bounce around, but you get the point. Anyways, Little Rock Theater plug. So, <sighs> let's change the current topic. How many of you have a positive opinion of video game publishers? Just out of curiosity. <laughs> I actually don't know Mega Dra uh, Dra Dragon. Uh, to answer really quick, if you're not sure wh what the quality of your mic is, just record a quick sound sample of you saying, Hi, it's me. Talk in a normal voice. Talk kind of in a quiet voice. Talk in a loud voice. And then toss it. I actually have a uh, channel specifically for auditions. Just toss it on there. So. Publishers. <laughs> what I find interesting about publishers, uh, I'm not going to get it if you whisper it on Twitch, Sildir, so just message me on Discord or whatever. I'll pull up Discord right now. Yeah, funnily enough, Paradox is a weird one. I hate Paradox because I love Paradox. I'm dead serious, by the way. Because Paradox puts out stuff that I absolutely adore and generally has a policy of... Uh, game publishing that I agree with completely from the creative side of things. You know, take the time you need, we'll support you, we'll we'll get you the game out the way it needs to work, but their business practices are awful, you know? It's like, god damn it. What are you doing here? I'm on the wrong playlist, I just realized. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I know nobody likes my music. There we go. Boom. <sighs> Anyways. So, uh, next point. Kingmaker. Anybody know what Kingmaker is before I start talking about it? <laughs> hey, Emperor Valerian. Um, now, fair enough, Hazardous. Yes, Pathfinder Kingmaker. Very good. Pathfinder Kingmaker is a video game that's supposed to come out this year. Can you believe that? Um, <laughs> I'll believe it when I see it. It's actually a module. Uh, well, it's based on a module, which I think is based on a book. I'm not sure about that part. For uh, for uh, for video game, it's going to come out for Pathfinder. It's going to be based on that. Uh, it's being worked on by a nice little studio, including Mr. Chris Avalone. Although he himself has flat out stated, no, I don't deserve all the credit, because he doesn't deserve all the credit. But he's working on it as well. And they were a kick Kickstarter project in order to get the game you know, funded and working. Kickstarter, of course, was successful. And then they went to a publisher. I don't even remember which publisher. God, I should have written it down. Hang on a second. Give me just a second. I believe so, Takoida. I could be wrong about that, though. Here we go. Uh, Deep Silver. 
Deep Silver is the publisher who's going to be publishing Pathfinder Kingmaker. Set in the ter dangerous and turbulent stolen lands, and will feature new characters, blah, 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 blah. Um, it's, it's a choices game. It's a CRPG based on choices. Now, I bring this up because, I mean, I'm kind of excited about the game anyways. Pathfinder is a setting that has very, very few, um, like, precious few, uh, video games for it. Like, unlike Faerun, for example, in which has a bajillion video games for it, there's hardly any video games for the Pathfinder setting. So that's neat just by itself. The Excuse me. There's also, uh... I haven't heard anything about that hazardous. All I heard was about the the partnership that they put out. Oh, you're talking about Deep Silver itself getting bought. Hang on, hang on. Considering this news is from like three days ago, I don't know. I mean, I know... Oh, okay. Yes, THQ Nordic bought Deep Silver. But that was like February. That was forever ago. <laughs> Anyways, sorry, get me get me off track here, get me off track here. Here's where I'm actually reaching for this. First of all, yay uh, for a new game with write, writing by Chris Avalone and set in the Pathfinder universe and a CRPG. All of that sounds on paper like awesome, so I'm kind of, you know, at least partially excited by that. But what I really want to talk about is the fact that this is a game that was kickstarted and then went to a publisher. Because this is a big gray area. This is one of those... There's no such thing as a good or a bad. It depends on exactly, you know, what is being done with the specifics kind of thing, at least in my opinion. Um, I'm curious what you guys think of that before we even go into any details about this. Yeah, We Happy Few did this. This is actually not an a uncommon thing. In fact, uh, Battletech did this as well. The recent Battletech, and is still doing this. Although Battletech, <laughs> uh, that company was actually bought by Paradox. And hi, Larian. Backlog. <laughs> we'll get there. Ignore the chopsticks. What? FF6 is being played yesterday. I had to get some sushi. I only got a little. Oh, absolutely, Savicon. See, the thing is, and Hazardous already kind of highlighted this, it's very easy for people to say, well, hang on, we already paid for the game, why do you need more money, right? Because that's the whole point of a publisher. A publisher is there to, uh, oh gosh, actually do a lot of things. A publisher is there to get the game from your computer to players. <laughs> Everything in, in between those two steps. Uh, signing deals either with GOG or with Steam, Arranging for physical distribution of media, if you're going for physical distribution at all, which you may not. Uh, production of the box, the box art. Uh, marketing is usually on the publisher side of things. And, of course, uh, spending the money necessary to make all that happen. Because games cost more money, yeah, because games cost more money. Um. <laughs> right? Um... Because, yeah, this, this, is, this is a very gray area. That's why I, I, I mentioned that right off the bat. It's like, hmm. Because on the surface, this makes a degree of sense. Hear me out. It's like the Kickstarter is going to make the game. You know, that's going to pay for the people who are going to be sitting down and actually making the assets and development all that. In fact, uh, when it comes to game development, just let me, let me phrase this more specifically. When it comes to the specific development of creating a game, they are filled with tremendous fear. Thank you very, very much, Eddie Ori. As ever, much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, words. Um, the... The biggest expense when it comes to that development is salaries. There, are, it, Now, this can vary, obviously, especially if you're a licensed game. But in general, if you're sitting down and like, let's go ahead and make a game. What's, you know, the, the, the majority of that expense is going to go into you paying all of your programmers and designers and artists and all that in order to produce the content of the game. It's all salary-based. So in other words, Kickstarter, in these circumstances, paying for the fact that they have 
you know, food and, and shelter while they're crafting these games. Uh, now, with the way digital distribution is right now, it's actually really, really cheap and easy to just say, all right, here's our game. You know, I, I could go make a game today and push it up on Steam right now. But the problem with that is is the one that every one of you is already thinking. If I just do that and push it up on Steam, no marketing budget, no effort. Uh, why, why would you gift me a subscription, Pretzel? <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah, it, it, what Takoya is saying, no one will ever know existed, right? No one will ever know it was ever even there. You need... It's, it's, this is an unfortunate reality. But I I feel I have actually gone okay, rewind. God, I am tired. I have gone on record as saying that oh a subscription. Well, that I don't know. Maybe maybe it'll go through in a second, Pretzel. Either way, thank you very very much. Um, as ever, much appreciated. Thank you. I have gone on record as saying that I feel that publishers are an out of date concept, and I kind of still think that, but mostly because I think that. I think that because of the fact, sorry Hanson, that I that too many publishers are still thinking of video game development and publishing as the old method, right? Like I, I think too many people are thinking that this is still the early 2000s or the 90s. And that's a problem because the market has changed wildly and drastically ever since then. I do think a publisher still has a valid purpose in existing nowadays. The question, the, the problem comes from when you go to a publisher and you say, please help publish my game, and the publisher says, okay, we own X percent of that game. Now, I know that sounds strange, but even from a business perspective, I think that's a bit of a uh, move. Um, it's an understandable move, but it's still a bit of a uh, move because it generally means <laughs> that uh, the way this tends to work out Statistically speaking, is the pro the proceeds from the game itself. Once the game sells, that usually goes into the publisher's pocket more than it does to the developer's pocket. I mean, if insert X game here smashes it out of the park, those developers will get money out of that. But not a lot. <laughs> this, this goes back all the way to the freaking voice acting thing. You remember the voice actor strike? Uh, last year? Is that last year? And I can't remember, it ended very recently, I remember that. And one of the biggest points there was how the voice actors were not being given their fair shake, which I agreed with, actually. Although there was, it was a more gray issue than just yes or no, as far as I'm concerned. But then, what isn't? But one of the big points that was being made at the time was how even the actual coders and designers and artists weren't actually getting, you know, being treated all that fairly either. Because... You know, programmers, uh, designers, creative leads, writers, uh, dialogue scripters, basic scripters, uh, artists, modelers. All of these people are all developers. I use that word a little bit generically, but I want to be more specific about this because I want to be very clear. These are the, the developers, the people who actually make these video games. And then there's the publishers. <laughs> who donate $50 for some reason. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing, Valerian? By the way, thank you for your help last night, Valerian. Um, specific percentages are usually not released to the public, Savakam, so I can't actually speak to that with total uh, experience. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Emperor Valerian. I will put that in the bank. Not the first bit from you I've put in the bank. You are awesome. Thank you very, very much. I very, very much appreciate it. I really do. Oh, speaking of which, everyone who uh, put their vote in, who made their voice heard last lore week and over the course of the week on the YouTube comments, thank you. Uh, it has been worthwhile and interesting information, and I have learned a bit. It's about what I expected, but it was nice to know from concrete data. Thank you. Uh, so, God, I, I, I wanted to talk about Kingsmaker, and I'm getting off on this whole economics thing. The point is... The problem, in my opinion, is not with the idea of publishers. It is with the execution of publishers. Um, the idea of someone saying, all right, we'll go and publish your game, uh, Bobonia, about the Bob, the epic of Bob, but 
we're going to go and own this percentage of it. And usually, and this is something that is a part of public record, there's usually some other parts of that agreement. Like, you have to do X number of DLCs, which is a more modern thing. You have to do X number of expansions. You have to do X number of additional games. And these additional games will also be owned by us at this percent, or these additional DLCs proceeds will be owned by us at this per blah, 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 blah. And publishers, in some cases, in this one we also know, uh, tend to have some degree of creative control. Um... Probably the most overt and obvious example of creative control from a publisher over a developer that I can think of right off the top of my head is Deus Ex Mankind Divided, an otherwise fantastic and amazing game that was informed in literally the last arc of game development that, oh, by the way, make a multiplayer DLC mode. <laughs> What are you guys doing? Why? I. Well, yeah, they're the money people. They're the money people. That's how that works. That's from Fateless. He doesn't even leave a comment. He just donated a bajillion dollars. <sighs> Thank you, Fateless. Um, would you like to put that to anything? No, I, I agree, Larian. I agree. It's like copyright. It is. I, I agree with the idea of copyright. I usually don't come ac across as someone who agrees with the idea of copyright, but that's because I disagree with copy wrong. <laughs> Binary domain. You got it. That's a game that looks awesome. I'm, I'm pretty sure that game is now funded. <laughs> I don't have my... I can't type domain. There we go. Um... So, that's why I look at this and I'm like, hmm. And I feel like publishers do have far too much of a bad shake. But, but I also think that the idea of a publisher is something that should, should, as well as could be a very good thing. You make the game. You sit there, you make that game, you polish that game to the highest sheen that you possibly can. We will handle marketing, we will handle making sure people are... Uh, interested, you know, hype generation. I know that's part of marketing, but you know, we will handle making sure people know about your game, making sure people are interested in your game, and making sure people are aware of your game. That's the three big pinnacles of marketing, and we will get your game out to the market. Bam! That right there, that sounds like an awesome idea. And I mention that because there are actually publishers that do that. I mentioned Paradox earlier. They actually have a great relationship with the developers that they tend to have working under them, at least by all accounts that I've seen. Like I said, their business practices are kind of bad, but from the creative side of things, yeah. Now, <clears throat> well, that's kind of what a publisher is, Henson, as weird as that may sound. Now, I do also agree with the idea that a publisher should defend their, their what is effectively their investment. That is something I understand. But there's a difference between, we want to make sure you're not, you know, mishandling this, and... You know, we want to have total control over everything, right? There, there's, there's room in the middle there. I also firmly think that we are at the point in time where a publisher who completely funds a work is acceptable within reason. Because that was one of the old things that publishers would do. A publisher would put, put up the money for you to make a game. That's one of the older models of things. It's still done to this day. Uh, Sony. Or not Sony. Actually, that's a bad example. Hang on a second. <sighs> Give me a second. Um, no, it is Sony. I was right. It actually is, it was Sony. Sony published God of War 4. That, that's an example of what I'm talking about. Sony said, bam, here's the money. You know, They actually funded the creation of the game, and then they funded the presentation and, and development and marketing, all that fun stuff of the game. So, good example of what I'm talking about. It's not like that model is something that can't be done. But again, weirdly enough, Sony was pretty hands-off with God of War 4. They were like, alright, take your time, do what you gotta do, we'll handle our side of things. <sighs> so who knows? <laughs> Maybe we're starting to shift a little bit away from publishers who are big, evil conglomerates of death. As soon as EA dies, we'll be cool. Uh, let's move on to our next topic, I don't have much else to say about this. And yes, that's, that's why I'm looking forward to the new Spider-Man coming out. That was another game which they're publishing and looks good and blah, blah, blah. 
All right, so our next topic is Google. Everyone's favorite company. <laughs> Let's get filled some with some fear here because of Mialik or Mijalik. I'm not actually sure how you prefer the pronounce, but nevertheless, thank you very, very much for the Twitch Prime sub, as ever. Much appreciated, much helpful, and much awesome. Where are my notes? There are my notes. My notes are buried by the donations. Here we go. Okay. Um, no, we're not going to talk about the YouTube thumbnails. That's barely even news. There we go. Uh, oh, I need a timestamp. Right, right, I need a timestamp. Uh, so many timestamps. Google. Oh, whoops, I didn't put the whole topic there, did I? I'm sorry. So Google is rumored, 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 rumored to be developing a new gaming console. I'm sure some of you at least have heard about this. <sighs> yeah, no kidding, Hazardous, I agree. So this is something I did want to talk about a little bit because at first I was just going to mention this in the fake news section. You know how I like to have a little fake news section at the beginning? And there were two fake news bits this week, uh, both of which kind of turned into full topics. Uh, this is one and Star Trek is the next one. So we're going to get another ooh yeah. <laughs> you remember the ooh yeah? Uh, but this is rumor. This is rumor. This is not confirmed. But a topic is here, I think at least, because I'm going to ask a very strange question. What's the point of another game console right now? Like, at the point we're at in history, what's the point of an additional gaming console? Now, for those of you who are around in the 80s and 90s, that may sound like a weird question. You remember when we had the TurboGrafx-16, uh, the Jaguar? Remember that? Uh, what else? We had the Genesis. We had the... Um, God, shoot. I actually can't think of all of them right now. It has been a while. Hang on a second. Let's see if I can find some others here. Uh, no, I apparently need the fourth his generation. There we go. Fourth generation gaming consoles. What do we got here? The PC Engine. <laughs> Ah, yes, the CDI, I can't forget. The Neo Geo, I forgot about the Neo Geo. What else we got here? <laughs> I actually had a friend who had a Neo Geo. I wanted to get a Neo Geo. I did not. Oh, yeah, there was also the Laser Active. Can't forget that. Commodore was still making stuff in this era, if you can believe it. We also had the Lynx. You remember the Lynx? No, of course you don't. Nobody remembers the Lynx. Don't lie to me. <laughs> How about the Mega Duck? I, I actually had never heard of that one, I'll be honest. <laughs> uh, and then we had, what do we got? The 3DO, there's the Jaguar, there's the Saturn. Ah, oh, rip, Saturn. The Dreamcast, everyone remembers the Dreamcast, of course. Um, the Amiga CD32, the PCFX, the Pladia, I remember that one. God. The Neo Geo Pocket. Okay, let me get to my point. Once upon a time, there were lots and lots and lots of gaming consoles, and everyone was in the market. But what happened is weirdly natural. Um, so this is going to sound like a strange statement, but if you look at just about any market, uh, especially if that market is a uh, self-contained market, so in other words, you know, I don't mean a market as in a local clothes shop. That is technically a market, but that's not what I mean. I mean clothing as a concept, as a market, is something you could use here, although that doesn't quite apply the same way. But if you look at just about any large-scale, self-contained market, you will see a trend over time towards, bit, bit by bit, the companies either die or are eaten by the other more successful companies until it gets to the point where there's each major company um, I'll use five in this case, because that's about where we're at right now with gaming. I think it's five. Hang on. Two, three. Yeah, five. I'm right. Um, that it, it gets to the point where this... Yeah, consolidation, exactly. It gets to the point where these people are focused on this thing, and these people are focused on this thing. Each one of them has carved out their own niche, basically. But those niches are huge. 
you know. And this is a very natural and logical thing, as weird as that may sound. It is, in fact, a very delicate balancing point, because the next step past this would be actual monopoly, which I'm not 100% in favor of, because monopolies rely on the goodwill of the people running the monopoly to not be horrible. <laughs> monopoly isn't necessarily horrible, but monopoly removes the... the uh, penalties for being horrible, right? Anyways. <clears throat> so, right now we have generated into these five. There's uh, PC, Microsoft, Sony, Nintendo, Mobile. These five. I'm actually, you notice I have removed handheld from this list because the 3DS is officially out the window. The Vita has been dead for years. <laughs> There really isn't actually a handheld market at this point. It's kind of been subsumed into other markets. This is what we got. Now, this actually makes a degree of sense. PC is duh. Right? Uh, Nintendo is just... They're just off doing their own thing. I don't even know what the hell they're up to. Uh, mobile is obvious. We all know what's going on with mobile. Then you've got Sony and Microsoft. Now... I actually get framed every now and again as being someone who's very anti-PlayStation, uh, which I always find hysterical, because of what I'm about to say. PlayStation is basically the gaming console right now. This is the classic, traditional, the ga video game console. Now, it's kind of... The PlayStation in general has wavered on this point, but they have pretty solidified this as of this point in time. That is the gaming machine. And the Xbox is what you get when you can't afford, don't know how to get, or don't want to put the effort into getting a PC. That's not an insult. Please, please don't take that as an insult, because it isn't. I actually understand that. In fact, I think there's a market for that. I mean, a PC, a decent P PC gaming rig is not that cheap. It is also something that is going to take some time and investment to figure out, and not everyone knows how to make a good gaming PC. And if you just go to buy a prefab, not only are you flinging your money into a fire, but you're getting something that's going to be substandard to begin with. So, again, please don't take that as derogatory. So, where's Google fit? Pax and I were talking about this uh, last night. And <laughs> have Windows 10 pre-installed. Um, Pax and I were talking about this. His, his guess, and I found this amusing, he was mostly saying this in jest, but still, is that uh, Google will either be a new Ouya... <laughs> or they're trying for the uh, Xbox market. B and there's been some... If the rumors are to be believed, rumor, 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 um, the idea is that they are aiming for the, specifically for the Xbox market. They want to make a rig that is a cheaper PC. You know, the, the exact same thing that the Xbox currently is going for. Whether that's a good thing or not, <laughs> you know, that's debatable. If it's the Ouya, then yeah, it's just another failed box of stupid. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> they could also, of course, be going to mobile. But if they're going into mobile, then that's not them making a new console. Because that's not what this is. This is not a console. <laughs> I mean, I hate to say that. <laughs> but, you know... It will definitely be Google Cloud and Google Interactive, which will be... Uh... But yeah, if rumors are true they're competing with Microsoft, who knows, right? I, I, I'm not sure. But li I, like I said, that original question intrigued me enough I wanted to make this into a full-time. What's the point? What's the point in this of Google? <laughs> a gaming tablet? I've heard of people trying to, to push into that market. I don't know if that's feasible anymore because... How do I phrase this? I absolutely believe that there's a sub-market for basically everything. Like, if, if, you, if I wanted to make trout-flavored yogurt, which is technically what I do on my show, um, if I wanted to make trout-flavored yogurt, there would be people who would buy that. As long, the, the problem is reaching your market, finding out who wants your product and getting your product to them or your service to them. Um, but, what did Sigma say? Gaming tablet. 
Um, but my point is that there have actually, for those of you not aware, there have been people who have already tried to make game focused phones. It is my opinion that a game focused phone is a very tiny market. Now, this is purely my opinion, but based on my own experience and my own studies on the matter, you know what the best, best advantage of mobile gaming is? Yeah, the, no, the end gauge, exactly. Um, the advantage of a mobile game is. Hang on, do I have one on here at the moment? I, I've got to have one for the little one. Here we go. Psst. So we'll fire this up. <laughs> waiting for my food. Waiting for the bus. Yeah, exactly. It's waiting for the bus. That's that's how I always think of it. Waiting for the bus. No social stigma. And oh, time to switch rides. Back in the pocket. Well, I haven't opened the pocket yet, have I? Oh, whatever. You get the point. The point is, you can do that on a phone. You don't need a gaming phone to do that, right? I mean, Christ's sake, my phone is not exactly a top-of-the-notch model, but I could play KOTOR on this if I really wanted to. <laughs> That's not a joke. I can play XCOM on this thing if I want to do. So again, I say, what's the point of a gaming-focused phone? Again, I I'm guarantee there's a niche for that. I, I firmly believe in the idea of submarkets. I just don't get the point of actually try have something like Google going into that, right? Oh, Grim Fandango, yep. Anyways. We'll see, I guess. Again, rumor. But as Hazardous mentioned earlier, I mean, I know what I do when I'm waiting for stuff, Hazardous. I actually do research. Better controls. Well, I mean, that, that's basically entering the Switch territory. That, that basically shifts into handheld rather than mobile, which I'm okay with, but, you know. Um, yes, I can, Mike Romano, but it's not out yet, so... Uh, yeah, I do research on my phone all the time. I actually have several bits, uh, several uh, browsers open right now, looking up some behind-the-scenes stuff for the game I'm looking at next. It's a Fire Emblem. Uh, Fire Emblem 8, I want to say. Now, that's actually an interesting idea, Nath Naztharun. God, I love that name, but I always mispronounce it. Um, yeah, I heard about that cool locker. In fact, I should check Amazon really quick. Because I would love to get one of those for a friend of mine. Nope, not on Amazon. Okay. Moving on. <clears throat> it's not so much that the whole of the market is covered as that... Let me put it to you this way. If you came to me right now... Imagine I am a money person. Not hard to imagine. I'm good at that. So, imagine I'm a money person. And you're coming to a meeting with me. And you want to make... Um, this, you've got this great idea. It's it's a fast food restaurant that serves burgers and fries. Now, yes, I did that, good boy. Thank you for asking. So you come to me with this idea, and I'm just going to be sitting here like... Because you are automatically starting behind. Like, like you follow me? You are starting from a negative before you even begin your process because that is a very dense market that's already well covered now I'm not saying it's impossible but you're gonna have to sell me on this that's that's my really my overall point here it's it's certainly within the realm of feasibility that Google could come out with the Googolia or whatever and the Googolia is like hey here's this new system and it's different somehow than everything else we've got um, and you know we're really su supporting indie developers or, or whatever right and Google, you know, that could work. I'm, I'm not saying it can't. But if you come to me, and I'm the money people, you're really going to have to sell me on this because you're because of the analogy I just gave. Now, I should clarify, you're in the United States, and you're trying to make a local burger joint. <laughs> and yeah, as Hazardous said, you are, you're running a marathon where everyone else is already a mile that way. I mean, that would be like uh, EA deciding to, to make their own digital distribution service. <sighs> Anyways. <clears throat> A fast food place that sells sushi. That exists. Um, existed? I should use past tense. I haven't been in California in a long time. 
but um, <laughs> I uh, there was an old restaurant. It was one of the conveyor restaurants, and you could just go up and get conveyors of sushi, or you could get you could just drive through and pick up sushi. And they made it right there. It was good sushi. Anywho, <clears throat> so we'll see what they're going with this. We'll see where they're going with this. Ah, uh, where's my timestamp thing? Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about Star Trek. Everyone likes Star Trek, right? You don't like Star Trek? What's wrong with you? No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Making sure those asterisks are nice and visible there. I like Voyager. The internet seems to think I don't like Voyager, but that's because they're stupid. I'm sorry. <laughs> I love it. I love it when people tell me my opinion on the internet. It happens so often nowadays. So, let's talk about how there is a confirmed... No, I did not surprise Ninja, although I do know the story of it. Uh, rumor. Uh, so there's confirmed fact that Kurtzman... Is, has signed a deal for five years of Star Trek television. That is fact. I actually talked about this, I, I want to say, last week. Um, go ahead, Valerian. Uh, the idea of... <laughs> of course, Valerian, forgive me. Now, that is fact. We know Kurtzman signed it. I've already talked about Kurtzman and how much I hate his guts. We'll see what comes of that. We know he's going to be the mainliner for Discovery. But people are just screaming about rumors about all these other Star Trek. I've actually seen Star Trek sites who are talking about, and these exact five shows are being developed. I have not been able to verify a single one of those rumors, and I have tried. I've actually gone looking, and it's like, okay, where's, where's the information? Where's this coming from? Nothing. Rumor. But the rumor is that there are several shows being developed. Uh, let's see. One was being set during um, Starfleet Academy days. Uh, one was being animated, and then there was like, and of course, there's the TNG one, the sequel to TNG. Of course, of course, everyone says there's a rumor there's going to be a sequel to TNG. Um, you know, given uh, given Roddenberry's era of season one and two TNG play, and that's fantastically amusing that that would be a thing. Interesting, Blue Wolf Alex. Yes, there's always there's going to be a sequel to TNG, of course, and they're going to bring back Patrick Stewart. It's going to be Patrick Stewart back. He's coming back. It's going to be great. TNG. It's going to be great. Rumor, 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 rumor. <sighs> That's not what I want to talk about because there's no news there. Fake news. What I really want to talk about is the benefit of animation versus real real action, live action. Because I was actually thinking about this while I was uh, going through some uh, DS9 stuff. And I was thinking about this while I was watching my niece last week. So I'm about to say something that's going to be controversial, and it shouldn't be. But my niece was watching a show called My Little Pony, which some of you are aware of. Now, I've kind of become aware of a lot of this show because I have a niece who's five. <laughs> so I have actually been kind of following the storytelling of the show. And one of the things I find interesting is that they're very big on that show of recurring characters. Now... From an now, ignoring MLP in particular, let's take the MLP part out of it because that's just controversial for some goddamn reason. Let's look at Pinkie Pie, Savicom. <laughs> let's look at, uh, let's look at the animation side of this thing, because if we look at the animation side of this, what we have is side characters who can make an appearance on screen but not say anything. And that really struck with me. I don't remember the episode, but there was this one episode where uh, they were like, they, they did this, this montage thing as a song was playing, and it showed like three or four characters who had been recurring characters throughout the season. They didn't say any lines, and that just stuck with me from a television creation pr presentation. Does, does that make any sense? Because all you need to do is animate that character. You don't need to bring in the voice actor and have the voice actor get set up and get their lines and get the voice director and read the lines, right? You can just show that character on screen and have that cameo or have that presentation. You can't do that with live action. 
This also clicked with me because I was doing some DS9 stuff this last week, and I was talking about Odo. René Bergenois has to go in for a significant makeup call for anything he does because he plays an alien. If Odo is in the background, it was uh, it was the Maquis Part 1. Uh, anybody who remembers that, that's the episode I was just covering. Uh, the Maquis Part 1. And Odo has like three lines in that whole episode. Like just bam, 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 and that's kind of it. But he still had to wake up early, because, you know, you have to get up at like three or four for the makeup call. Get up, get sit, just sit there for X number of hours while they slowly paint all of the thing. And then he had to get up and stand there and say his three lines. And that's it, just to have him there. Think about that for a second. And that just sort of stuck with me, those two thoughts uh, kind of circling there. Because this is all... Yeah, Morn is another example of this. Although, um, anyone Klingon is probably worse than this. Exactly, Takoda, exactly. So, it to be clear, I'm not saying that real life needs to go away or anything. That's ridiculous. Uh, obviously, there are definite advantages to having, you know, real uh, physical actors in real life uh, television. But the difference with being able to do so much when it comes to recurrences and continuity with regards to characters in a show that has people that don't look human, right, is phenomenal when it comes to an animated work. And then, then this rumor came out with TNG, 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 and I admit... Interesting, Blue Wolf Alex. Uh, I admit, uh, as I was looking at this, my knee-jerk reaction... Well, okay, my, my first reaction was, yeah, right. My second reaction was, that makes sense. Hear me out. Because if you were to do a TNG sequel, now, you couldn't use the same actors. Not physically. But their voices haven't changed all that much. Have you heard them? I have heard Jonathan Frake's voice as recently as just a couple days ago because I was listening to some uh, clips that Zed Slayer was linking. Um, I, well, or rather, f clips from the same convention he was at, to be more clear. But you bring in the voice actors, and they can actually speak the lines, and they will sound older, because they are older, like 20 years older. But you can do that. Now, I'm not advocating this per se, but again, it, it just called to mind so many possibilities when it comes to doing... An animated work, and it's worth noting, animated doesn't have to be cartoon. A CGI work is also an animated work. We're at the point now in real life history and television production where making a CGI show is a lot cheaper than it used to be. You remember, anyone remember Reboot? Anyone remember Reboot? No? Megabyte, ah, right? No? Okay. <laughs> it's not that, it, my point is, this is not the Reboot era anymore. We are now at the point where it is commonplace to actually have shows that are done in CGI style. In fact, even some actual animated cartoon shows are done with CGI and then painted over. They're just done two-dimensionally rather than three-dimensionally. Um, because it has gotten that, that uh, relatively streamlined. To produce. To produce the fear. Thank you very, very much, if and but. Uh, hex I liked Hexadecimal, too, actually. Hexadecimal and Megabyte are the only two characters I can name off the top of my head from Reboot. Well, and Gigabyte, but that doesn't count. Why not, Savicom? Um, so... <laughs> yeah, actually, as Tigzar says, the only way we could have James Earl Jones back is... Uh, Vader back is because of his voice. Yeah, absolutely. This is also pretty much the point in time where that's feasible. If we wait too many more years to do a TNG CGI or animated show, it's not happening because those guys are getting into their 80s. I know that sounds horrific, but pragmatically speaking, if you're going to do something with that, you have to basically have already started now. This is the only reason I'm willing to give this rumor any credence, by the way. Because I can't be the only one thinking this. Of the many flaws I will lay at Kurtzman's feet, and there are so many, he is a Star Trek fan. I guarantee you this thought has run through his head. So. I 
Aw, oh, that sucks, Zedslayer. Damn it. I was really hoping to get that question with uh, with Frakes. But anyways. Uh, yeah, it'll probably never happen or it'll be bad. That is most likely the case. I mean, I've seen the animated series of T Star Trek. But at the same time, it's worth noting the animated series for Star Trek was garbage because of how it was made. Not because of the fact that an animated Star Trek show was a bad idea. In fact, I've actually been in favor of the, of the idea of an animated Star Trek series for years. Since I was a kid. Um, because here's the thing. For those of you know, just side story really quick. If you ever look into the making of Star Trek the Animated Series, holy crap. So they, their budget was this. <laughs> they had a shoestring budget because they insisted on bringing back all the original actors. So it was mega cheap. And it was being done by one of the worst animation studios of the era. And that is not exaggeration. That's not even opinion. <laughs> I do, Trickster Slab. I absolutely do. I, um, I always need more NPC voices, if nothing else. Um, so the, the problem with the animated series was not the fact that it was a bad idea. The, it was just badly made. <laughs> it's something that could work in my opinion. I will also say, just as a private opinion, that I think a lot of the voice acting work was just kind of bad in that. I don't know what to blame that on. Because that's... Usually, if there's bad voice acting work, you blame it on either the actors, the voice director, or both. Not sure which of those is the case there, but it was weird to hear someone who certainly sounded like William Shatner, but... At the same time, sounded like some guy reading a line. Yeah, there was the total lack of... If you've ever seen the animated series, there's no enthusiasm, no energy, no nothing in the way they perform their lines. It's kind of pathetic, actually. <laughs> Not to cast more blech upon the animated series, but you get my point. Getting back to the point. Getting back to the point. I would like to see an attempt at a TNG animated series. I would. Maybe CGI, maybe full cartoon. I don't actually care because that part doesn't matter to me, to be completely blunt. What matters to me is that you get some good scripts. That's, that's, that's point number one right there for Star Trek. Get some good writers on board and that you use it to good effect. You get some good people involved in animating it and you get some good people involved in voice directing it. I, I, I agree, Blue Wolf Alex, but I don't know. That's why... I say I don't know. I suppose we'll see what happens. So I'll, I'll be watching the news on this one. If I have any news, I will let you guys know. Because Lord knows at least some of my viewers, one or two of you, care about Star Trek. <laughs> but the other reason I wanted to bring this up, and this is kind of a segue here. Super smooth segue. Super professional guy that I am. I mean, I'm in a coat. What do you want from me? I do hope you like this coat because it was not cheap. <laughs> I've been looking for those of you who've been following me you know I've been looking for a new blazer for god months at this point like three months something like that so I'm glad to have finally settled on one that doesn't make me want to tear my arms off uh, there we go Let's segue into a sponsorship ad. No, I don't have any sponsors. Um, so... Whew. Not really, Savicom. I mean, there's obviously some bias that has to be defeated there. But that bias can be defeated and has been. Ask anyone, especially in geek circles, if cartoons are for kids. And they'll laugh at you because... If nothing else, the DCAU. Even if you don't know about the greater DCAU, I imagine almost everyone in chat knows to some extent or another about Batman the Animated Series, which is what effectively kicked off the DCAU. And that was a very serious, well-done, well-written, proper car you know, cartoon show that was definitively not for kids. There were some kids' moments in there, of course, but that was a damn good show. Shows, I should say. I really should clarify that. <laughs> right? And, of course, uh, granted, that is superhero like Tigzar just mentioned. But the fact the fact is, it's not for kids. That's what I'm trying to say. 
Hell, even Animaniacs wasn't for kids. To keep this going a bit here. Anywho, <clears throat> story arcs. So, I'm not going to mention... <laughs> Can't even do my own joke. I'm not even going to mention Angry Joe in Kingdom Hearts 3. There we go. Just got it out there. Um, but, uh... Let's talk about story arcs. I do actually remember that one hazardous. That was a good one. Oh, hello? 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 What 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 am I hearing? I just wanna say hi. Wait, come here, come here. I wanna hug. Please? Please. Please give me a hug, please. I don't want them to leave without me. Don't worry, they won't leave without you, kiddo. I'm gonna miss you, kiddo. I saw that he was on Blue the, was on there. Yeah, that's right. She was, wasn't she? Yeah. Oh, you'd be good, okay? okay. You gonna miss me? Yeah. I'm gonna miss you too. You have a good ride. I'll have two weeks with him. I know. And then you'll have three weeks with me. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you're excited. Bye, kiddo. Bye. Thingy. Bye. I love you. <sighs> no, we call her Mini Z. We're switching to Mini Z for legal reasons. It's stupid. Um, what the hell was I talking about? <laughs> right. Let's try that again. I can't get the snap right today. There we go. Story arcs. Um, there's two perspectives on this. This is actually a bit of a gray topic, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring this up, because I feel like there's an actual topic here. If I said to you, and I have three examples on my note right now, if I uh, said to you, yeah, no kidding, I was like, why is this clipping so weird? If I said to you right now, all right, <clears throat> um... Do you think a new, uh, someone who's never even played any of the other Kingdom Hearts games, uh, let me rephrase this for me, do you think Kingdom Hearts 3 should be built with people who've never played Kingdom Hearts in mind? What would your response to that statement be? I got another one for you. Uh, do you think someone should jump into Halo 5? That, that they should change Halo 5 to adjust for new players? given Halo 5's position in the franchise. Do you think Infinity War, the recent movie, should be changed to accommodate people who have not seen the rest of the MCU? Do you think that Mass Effect 3, let's just go with the, the, the thing it always comes back to with me, do you think Mass Effect 3 should be de dealt with to accommodate blah, 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 right? Woof. That's that's my answer to this. Woof. Woof. They're leaving, dog. They're not coming back for like eight hours. Don't worry, I'll walk you later. Actually, no, Tricksters. Uh, this was actually sponsored... Uh, sponsored? Wow. <laughs> sponsored by... I don't have anything here. Uh... Sponsored by Raid. When you really need to kill bugs immediately... Get the, what is this? Get the Wasp and Hornet contact poison. Um, <clears throat> no. The Dollar Shave Club. Sponsored by the Dollar Shave Club. No, my point is, this is actually, I, I can't even remember what actually prompted this co concept. But something prompted this. We were talking about, uh, oh, we were talking about markets. Uh, me and a friend of mine were talking about new markets. And then, a as I was thinking that was going to be something that was worthy of a topic. And then someone brought up the... Uh, Angry Joe thing, and then someone brought up the Infinity War thing, and I was like, okay, I think this is something we're talking about. <laughs> oh, it is De Gaulle. There's a reason I've got a can of it right next to my computer at all times. Because I spend a lot of time here, and I like to kill bugs immediately. Damn it! There we go. That's the other half of the universe. Uh, maybe it was the last Jedi thing. I don't know. Anyways, the point being... Point being... In my opinion, this is a more gray area than it sounds. Because, here's the deal. If I write a trilogy of books, 
I don't think I should make the third book in that trilogy designed for newcomers, right? I'll use a direct example. Uh, the Thrawn trilogy. Let's go back to a book that most of you have probably actually seen, right? Or read. The original Thrawn trilogy by Timothy Zahn, right? If you just jumped into The Last Command right now, you'd be like, huh? Right? I think most of us can get on board with that idea. However, everything needs to have... Uh, ways to get new people in. That is literally mandatory. I, I know that sounds like a strange thing, but it is absolutely mandatory for any given long-standing franchise or series or creative work to be able to cycle in new people. That is That has to happen. It is an economic certainty that if for whatever reason you had no new viewers or readers or, or whatever coming in, then you will eventually bleed out all your existing audience. That's BAM. Absolutely mandatory. So, what I have noticed is that too many people seem to look at these two facts and confuse them. Because I have heard people say, word for word, well, I shouldn't say that because I don't have a word for it quoted, but paraphrased, some people show up and say, hey, I love how like seven. I need I need everyone to tell me about the Kingdom Hearts collection. Everyone tell me about what I already know about and have known about for three weeks. <laughs> Keep it coming, guys. Come on. I personally think I kind of lose my train of thought here. Um, if you're going to have too many people, seem to confuse the fact that you need new market with you have to always make something for new viewers and new games and new players and blah blah blah. Um, it was the argument that Bioware gave, back with Mass Effect 3. And it was a valid argument applied completely wrong. Well, we need to constantly be getting new players into Mass Effect. We need to constantly be pulling new people into Mass Effect. That's true! But you don't make the third of a trilogy the point to do that. The point to do that would have been Andromeda, if we were to stretch this analogy a little bit. <laughs> right? And that's my point. Too many works of fiction don't seem to understand that you don't just make every new thing. Hey, come on in. Come on in. No. <laughs> Way too many people seem to think, and this, this applies beyond just video games. I don't know why I'm just playing with these chopsticks here. Way too many people. This is, this is, I'm, I'm pretend I'm EA and this is Bioware. New, new people need to be brought into the Mass Effect series. Therefore, we will go ahead and go forth with the idea of making Mass Effect 3 for people who've never played the series before. Now, Kingdom Hearts, the problem with Kingdom Hearts, well, I shouldn't say the problem, but the problem from our perspective, so let's talk about the three examples I already gave. Kingdom Hearts is the conclusion of a story arc. It, it, I've been using the term trilogy, but trilogy is just a fancy word for arc, hence the topic, a story arc. Kingdom Hearts has been on one story arc from Kingdom Hearts 1 to Kingdom Hearts 3 one cohesive story arc. If you go into Kingdom Hearts 3 without making any effort or attempt to learn the Kingdom Hearts series, you're not going to get it. And I do not think they should make Kingdom Hearts 3 dumbed down or change Kingdom Hearts 3 itself. I need more people to tell me this, Trickster. Everyone tell me this. I do not, I do not think that people should go into Kingdom Hearts 3. Uh, I, I don't think they should change Kingdom Hearts 3 to accommodate new people. That would be wrong and stupid and dumb, in my opinion. Now, of course, as 700 people have already said in chat, slight exaggeration, um, Kingdom Hearts is, they're actually going to be releasing this whole lore catch-up video for Kingdom Hearts 3. I hear this guy named Lore Runner did a whole Kingdom Hearts lore run you could watch if you feel like having the time. And, um, and of course they have the new bundle, which is every Kingdom Hearts game within reason uh, available on, uh, on the PS4. Still not on the two systems I want it on. I will buy that if it comes out on the Switch or the PC. <sighs> yeah, I wonder too, actually, Dakota. Nah, I hear it. I hear his, his YouTube channel is a terrible channel. Let me do that. Yeah, I know, Max Time. They've already... For those of you at home not aware, they've already released these videos in J Japanese. But anyways, getting back to my point, that's not exactly a bad idea because it doesn't change Kingdom Hearts 3. Now this is the core point I'm really circling around here. In my opinion, far too many times people will say, hey, um, 
let's go ahead and change our given work to accommodate new players, to accommodate new viewers, to accommodate new people. That is what I disagree with. Anybody who watched my Babylon 5 ruminations knows I made a point of that several times, where every now and again, uh, JMS would more or less deliberately be like, remember this? in order to try and accommodate new viewers or viewers who had forgotten it throughout the course of the series. And that irritated me. I understand its purpose, but it still irritated me because he changed the core work. He didn't do something to present it to, to, new, to new viewers. Now, funnily enough, Babylon 5 is also an excellent example of what I'm talking about because, for those of you who were around when Babylon 5 was coming out, when TBS first picked it up, was it TBS? Um, maybe it was TNN. Crap, I don't remember. It was one of the T channels. Uh, first picked up Babylon 5 and really started pushing it uh, into Season 4, or, or was it 3? God, I'm missing... I don't remember the numbers, please forgive me. They did an entire... They recorded a whole separate here's what Babylon 5 thing is to get people caught up because it had been on this nobody channel prior to that. That's good. That I'm in favor of. I was like, here, this is what Babylon 5 is. Was it TNT? God, I honestly don't remember. I know it was a T. <laughs> I know it was a T. But here, let's let's bring in new viewers. Let's get people interested in this franchise that has an ongoing story. It was TNT. Okay, thank you. It was TNT. And yeah, I agree, Cashel. Ultima 9 is actually one of the worst examples of this. Um, and Mass Effect 3. I mean, let's just go again with the next example. Now, Mass Effect 3 had other issues. But one of the biggest things that irritated me was how much, as you know, was in Mass Effect 3. I pointed out a bunch of that during the Mass Effect lore run. And the whole reason of the, as you know, was for people who just had were new to the franchise. And Bioware flat out stated, we're doing this because we want to get new people involved in Mass Effect 3. <laughs> I dropped my chopsticks. Um, yeah. yeah. Infinity War. Let's use the next example I mentioned. Infinity War has nothing, like, like you, you cannot watch Infinity War and get it, really get it, without watching the MCU, by design. I was actually really happy, from a purely creative perspective, no spoilers here by the way, um, I, but I was very happy from a creative perspective that Infinity War was made for people who'd been watching the MCU. That they did not bow to that pressure, and that the, ga the game, the movie itself, was... You've been watching this the whole time. We're built for that. We're built for you guys, etc., etc. Um, I liked that. I liked that they put their foot down creatively on that one. I really did. It didn't stop some reviewers and some critics from saying, Hey, this is dumb because... Who are these people? Because I didn't watch or didn't remember the MCU. Now, as I've said before, it is entirely possible to make a creative work and still make it for new viewers and old viewers. I've actually got two examples for this right off the top of my head, because I've already, I've already prepped these. Kingdom Hearts 2. Now, that sounds like a weird one, but for anybody who's familiar with Kingdom Hearts 2... Um, so there, they're coming for you. Uh, Kingdom Hearts 2 has, a one, in my opinion, a wonderful intro. I don't care. I think the intro is great. But during the intro, spoiler alert, it basically summarizes several key aspects of Kingdom Hearts 1's story, along with a tiny tidbit of Chain of Memories. In other words, if you had never played 1 or Chain of Memories, you still got most of the, the significant plot points in Kingdom Hearts 2. You missed the nuances, you missed the details, but in several cases, they still made it clear that you could understand what's going on based on how they did it. Now, they didn't do it perfectly. I don't want to give them too much credit. But another example of this, again, to keep using Kingdom Hearts 2, is later on in the game... Now, this is getting into a little spoilery territory, but whatever. Kingdom Hearts 2 spoiler. Uh, there's a later part of the game where you're in Hollow Bastion, which hasn't been renamed yet, and Mickey shows up and he's like, I'm trying to find Ansem. And Sora is like, no, come here, come here, this is Ansem, right? So you get the idea of who that was, what his connection was to all the people, based on how Sora 
Donald and Goofy reacted to Ansem both in the Tron section and with regards to Mickey. Again, showcasing some of the story points of one in two while still making it a relevant point of two. I'm always shaking. I, I really am. It's a normal thing. Uh, you should see my, my mother. She's about at this point right now. <laughs> so, that's a thing you could do. Now, that's one example of that, because obviously Kingdom Hearts 2 is still part of the arc of Kingdom Hearts, which has been going through the whole thing. But, there's another example of this, and that is God of War 4. In God of War 4, uh, you don't have to have played God of War 1, 2, or 3 to get the relevant story points of God of War 4. Right? It will mean more if you have played 1, 2, and 3. But, and it was clearly designed for people who have played 1, 2, and 3. But you will get the significance of the Greek gods, of what happened with Zeus, of what happened with, uh, oh god, I can't remember her name all of a sudden. What's her face? And the significance of the blades, right? You get all of that. As you're going through God of War 4. Athena, thank you, Athena. Couldn't think of her damn name. Um, you get you get the You get the relevance if you don't get the specifics. Now, this is why I wanted to use God of War 4 and Kingdom Hearts 2 hazardous, because these are two separate examples. Kingdom Hearts 2 is in the middle of a series. God of, uh, excuse me, excuse me, in the middle of an arc. And God of War 4 is at the beginning of a new arc. However, both of them still manage to apply here's for new viewers within the game without changing it in a negative fashion. Mass Effect 3. Um, very much true, Leander. So, <laughs> the, uh, the other example I wanted to give uh, related to this was uh, actually Witcher 3, which is just a duh. Witcher 3 is a slightly different example, though, because in my opinion... Witcher 3 is not connected to Witcher 1 or Witcher 2. In my opinion, Witcher 1 and Witcher 2 are part of the same story arc. But in my opinion, Witcher 3 is a completely separate story arc. So this would qualify as the God of War 4 type of example. You know, this is a new story arc, therefore is designed with new players in mind. They do summarize quite a bit of the aspects and features of what happened in previous Witchers, and we get a lot of lore of the Witcher setting in Witcher 3. So, in my and of course I love Witcher 3 and I think it's an awesome game. You should all buy, buy it and play it immediately. So, give me my money, CD Projekt Red. Um, I think that worked. I also will say Witcher 3 worked for me because I haven't read the books and won't. Let me just make that very clear. Um, other than the one book I read, which I don't even remember what it is anymore. Uh, but Witcher 3 continuing managed to continue from the books even if you didn't read them. And I think that's kind of awesome, the way they did that. But again, that's down to the specifics and tightness of the writing. Was it Last Wish? I don't remember. It's been years. It's been a lot, many, many years since I read a Witcher book. And of course, as Larian points out, anybody who cares can probably... Th I mean, this is 2018. Current your argument. Um, this is 2018. It is not that hard to go and find information on a store, on an ongoing story right now. I could go to Google right now. Here, hang on, hang on. Hey Siri, Kingdom Hearts story. Hmm, I'm not finding anything for Kingdom Hearts story. Okay, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> not what I was expecting. Let's try this instead. Let's go to Google. <laughs> Kingdom Hearts story. According to Wikipedia, the series starts with Kingdom Hearts, where a 14-year-old boy named Sora is separated from his friends Riku and Kairi when their world tests. Uh, <laughs> Siri fails. Um, yeah, the system's like, go to Google, dude. <laughs> Uh It'll link to me. No. <laughs> uh anyways. My point is there is it, it, this is obviously a gray. 
This is obviously a big gray situation. But one of the things I have been very adamantly against for many years is the idea of taking an existing story arc and trying to negatively impact it, alter it and change it to accommodate new viewers. Anybody who's watched me for any significant length of time knows that one of my biggest pet peeves when it comes to writing is, as you know, and the most predominant example of, as you know, is exactly that. When an existing story arc ha is trying to bring in new viewers or players or whatever and, and just jumps in a ton of really bad exposition in the form of, as you know, and that irritates the crap out of me. <laughs> I guess it's one of my two biggest pet peeves right there. Just, ooh. And I agree. I agree. I would not have them dumb down the Kingdom Hearts story at all. As I, thank you, Sigma. For, what Sigma just said is a joke, but is also a perfect example of as you know. As you know, I don't like the as you know cliche. That is literally an as you know there. Anyways. <sighs> moving on, moving on. I don't have anything else to say about this. Here's hoping Kingdom Hearts 3 is awesome. I was going to bring a Halo, but I think we've made our point. Uh... As you know, as just I can't speak to that personally, Cashel. That's why I didn't bring that up. Because I've only played one Yakuza game. Oh, Jesus, playing. Did you really? Did you? Kingdom Hearts Story. And it, it took a long time to process that. Because candy... Let's talk about gaming enthusiasm. Oh, hang on. Where's my notes? How many of you are old? <laughs> the only one who can tell you if you're old is you. For record. I feel old. But then again, I've been through hell multiple times in my life, and my body is literally not great. <laughs> no mental issues. I'm very happy about that. I was actually thinking about that recently. For all my health issues, I have no mental health issues. <sighs> the reason I bring this up... Don't jinx it. The reason I bring this up is because <sighs> workaholic fever. That's something separate, Dakota. My blacklist? Oh, right, right, right. Eh, no, I disagree with that, Hazardous. But anyways, I just, uh, moving on. Um, I'm 36, I think. And what year is this? I am turning 36, sorry. Very soon. And, uh, about a month and a half from now, something like that. Um, I don't actually feel old. That's why I didn't raise my hand uh, internally. I do feel old physically, but as I said before, I'm not actually that old. It's just I've been through some hells, and I I am still getting to the point where my uh, immune system isn't actually working all that well. You know, my I, I still have physical issues which, with regards to energy. It's very hard to keep up with a hyperactive five-year-old, for example. But I have noticed that as someone gets older, the way we perceive video gaming in particular tends to alter. Now, let me just make this very, very clear. Uh, the idea that video games are only for kids is stupid and dumb. To play that as, as absolutely nicely as I can. That is the nicest way I can say that. Anybody who thinks video games are just for kids is stupid and dumb. But I distinctly recall how differently, because I, I actually have a very good memory. I know that sounds weird, uh, but I have very good uh, memory about certain things. Uh, music, visual, and feeling are the three big things I can remember very distinctly. So I remember how things look, I remember how things sound, I remember how I feel at a given point in time. Names, eh. <laughs> eh. 
But I bring that up because I remember how I felt playing different games throughout the course of history and how video gaming as a hobby has kind of developed for me over time. I actually probably feel more invested in video games now than I ever have. And I don't just mean because of the show. Because, as anybody who's watched any of my premiere runs knows, when I get into a game for the sh even if I'm playing it for the show, I'm like, ah, oh, this is awesome, right? Like, anybody saw me, the Detroit run, right? Yeah! Oh, God, that was great. I mean, there were issues, and, and I don't know what the hell was going on with Marcus, but, oh, God! <laughs> right? Or how about, um, what's another one we did recently? Kingdom Come Deliverance. I, I love that some people said I didn't like that game, because I adored that game. I was cheating my brains out, but I adored playing through that game, right? But I've noticed that, of course, we tend to have... Or, or Subnautica! Oh my god, Subnautica. I, I loved it, though. I didn't want to stop playing. Um, going through these games, I don't think my enthusiasm has gone away. I think my enthusiasm has actually gotten more complex, more than anything else. That's true, Palin. Uh, I would say Detroit Zagoten, to be completely honest with you. But... Uh, but at this... I would actually say it probably has risen, in all, if anything. The one thing that's really... It, it's different, exactly. Has I'm trying to, to circle around this topic. I feel different. I feel like I am differently inclined towards games than I used to be. Because when I was a kid, video games were something to do to pass the time. Like, I remember distinctly when I had... Well, that's actually... Okay, that's a lie. Um, but let me give you a, a direct example. To, when I was very young, I played Super Mario Brothers because it was something I could do with my dad. I pray, played... Uh, so let's, let's move forward in time a little bit more. I played Super Mario Brothers 3 because I thought it was a great form of interactive entertainment. I, ever since I was a kid, I've been in favor of more interactive entertainment than just passive entertainment. No no negative statements on passive entertainment. It's just I've always been more in favor of interactive entertainment, personally. So, you know, I'm playing is because it's interactive, and it was something to fill the time. It's like, okay, I got home from school. Uh, Mom's not going to be home for a few hours, right? So uh, did my chores, and then I would go with... God, I want to say her name was Kate. You know, I'd go hang out with Kate, and we'd play Sonic. Or she'd come over to my place, and we'd play, uh, you know... Uh, God, what did I have at that point in time? Probably Mega Man, to be honest with you. Like, Mega Man 6, right? It was something to do that was entertainment. But it wasn't until Final Fantasy IV on the SNES that I started actually becoming invested in games, if that makes any sense. And that just kind of kept going over time. Now... One of the other interesting foibles that everyone seems to just sort of accept as true is that we have less time as we grow older, right? I mean, everyone knows that, right? Right? You can tell I'm building up to something here. While that is factually true, it is also, in my opinion, a bit of a logical fallacy. It is my opinion that too many people utilize the I have less time now that I'm older thing as an excuse to not bother to do anything. I actually know people personally who do this. We, even as adults, we have, we have less overall mathematical time than we did as kids. But that does not mean we don't have time. That does not mean we don't have availability or... <sighs> we can still have hobbies, right? I'm going to use a personal example. This is not me. This is someone I know. I'm not going to name names because I don't name names on my show. Uh, we'll call him Bob 3. So Bob 3 is someone who is like, Oh man, I really want to play such and such, but I just don't have time. And then he goes and he lounges on the couch and watches a rerun of a show that he's already seen. Bob 3 is the kind of person who I'll say, hey, I would really, you know, you want to go do such and such. And he's like, ah, I'd love to, but, you know, I'm going to be spending uh, some time in the shed working on such and such. Now, this is not me casting derogatory nature upon his hobbies. But what I've seen here is the fact that, and, and this is only one example because I've seen this in many, many people, that too many people automatically assume 
that because they don't have time, they can only do stuff that doesn't matter, and so they can only do stuff that doesn't matter, and therefore they don't make time. Am I making any sense? It, it, this is a form of time management, in other words. That someone like Bob 3 could, if he wanted to, sit down and, and just start playing Super Metroid. Which is a game uh, he has recently completed. He could do that. He has the time to do that. He just has to decide to put that into his the, the time allotment that he has. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that I don't see that gaming enthusiasm actually wanes with age. I'm sure it does with some people. Obviously, there's everyone's going to be different to some extent or another. I was even recently called extremely pretentious by two separate people for the fact that I made a comment about how people are chemically different from each other. <laughs> but... I, I completely understand the idea that some people do not want to make that time for whatever reason. But they still can. Even I make time for games for myself. I do it in the time when I'm on my exercise. Because I'm trying to... Because, you know, I've, I've talked about this, the Switch, you know. But I still do it. I still play games just for myself. I'm going through Hyrule Warriors right now. It's a good game. I'm enjoying it more than I thought it would. And the other thing... Now, there is something else here, and I want to talk about this briefly just while we're on the topic. One of the things I've noticed is that some people will look at, and this is the... Uh, there's got to be a, a concept for this. Let's call it the automobile concept. Bear with me, I swear it makes sense. Let's say I'm looking at The Witcher 3. Let's use a direct example, okay? Witcher 3 is a huge game, right? Now, cracks in time, what I call cracks is like 10, 15 minutes of, of little... That's not going to work, right? You can't play Witcher 3 in 10-minute bursts. But, let's say you've got two or three hours at the end of your night, you know. Kids taken care of, um, you've gotten off work, you've eaten, you've done whatever chores you need to do. And now, okay, I've got two hours, three hours, whatever, right? So then you sit down. <laughs> You're funny, Balan. You just see so you sit down and you play Witcher 3 for a couple hours. Then you save and you walk away. Next day. You you already know where I'm going with this, don't you? The reason I call this the automobile thing is because too many people, and this is this is a very common psychological problem, will look at the concept, the the, the project of analogy, making an automobile. And that's a huge job. There's so many parts and so many things need to go in so many places, and that's insane. And then people lock up. People say, ah, I can't do that. People say, oh, I don't have time for that. This is a very, very common psychological problem. Um, because... I, I, I'm trying really hard not to sound preachy. Because you can do that. You can make an automobile. You just break it down into individual tasks. Don't... Let me use something a little more relatable. You don't look at your house and say, I can't clean the house. That would take forever. And then give up on cleaning, right? No. You vacuum the living room. And then the next day you wipe down the kitchen. And then the next day you try to get all the laundry done. And then the next day you deal with the windows. And then the next day you go and you get rid of all the, the dust. And so forth and so on. You break big things down into little pieces. This makes this doable. And this absolutely applies to hobbies, just as it does to actual, you know, chores or work or whatever. You don't look at The Witcher 3 and say, God damn, it's like a 90-hour game. I'm not going to be able to play that. I'll just, I'll just play Flappy Birds. No, no. Sit down, compartmentalize it, say, I want to do two quests. I actually have done this before. I want to get these two quests done. And you do it, and then you save, and then you move on. You go do other stuff. You come back the next day or the next break in your time and say, Man, I'd really love to see what's going on with that one quest. So I'm going to do that quest, that quest, and i kind of like to at least get one more level. There we go. Save, move on, right? This also is a problem. <laughs> is also yeah, No, the strategy games have this exact same problem, too. Absolutely. Um... This is also a problem when it comes to uh, things you're already in the middle of. For example, how many of you have had the problem of getting to X point, especially in an RPG? This is a really big problem in RPGs. Getting to X point in an RPG, and then 
saving and moving on and then saying, ah, oh, I don't have time. You, you just look at it and you think about how much is left in the RPG and, oh my god, I can't possibly play that. So you don't. You put it off. And you put it off. And you put it off. And then it, get, then it compounds itself because later on you go back and you're like, all right, let's see. Where am I at? Where am I at? Who the hell is that guy? What was I even doing? Uh, hang on, where am I? Pull up the map. Let's see here. This this is a bad. Where's my switch? I mean, he's a real gaming machine here. Ah, there we go. Let's see, where am I? Um, screw it. I'll just start over. Right. Start over. Start over. I actually know someone who had this loop problem of getting to a certain point. Quitting because he felt he was there was too much to do. Starting over, you know, basically being like, oh god, where the hell was I? And then starting over and just doing this over and over and over and over and over. I know this sounds a lot like a life hack. <laughs> but this is what I do. I work my ass off, 10 hours a day, 7 days a week. I still make time to do hobbies and real life. Because... Because in my opinion, without things like hobbies, what's the point? To get real for a second. If you don't enjoy life, what's the point? Right? I, I Forgive me for sounding angry, but I have had so many arguments over my years with people who are like, why do you need fun in your life? Why do you need entertainment in your life? Why do you need to watch Star Trek? Why do you need to play video games? Why do you need to go and hang out with your friends? And I just, I've had so many arguments with those people. <sighs> In my opinion, entertainment is a need. Now, obviously, within reason, right? <laughs> Water is important to living, but you still take this within reason, right? But you still need it. So, I hope <laughs> that people like Jongo will spend more time and effort on hobbies. Whatever those hobbies are. It doesn't have to be video games. And Tigzar made an excellent point earlier. Sometimes you just move on from a hobby. Sometimes, for whatever reason, that hobby just stops being interesting to you. And that's fine, and that's even normal. Find something else, you know? There's, there is so much to do in life. As, I call it hobby. But really, all a hobby is is something that you are invested in that you derive enjoyment out of. That's that's all a hobby is. It's it's entertainment. There are so many different ways to be entertained in life that, uh, you know, don't, don't fall into a trap. An old friend of mine, this is many years ago, I haven't talked to him in years, uh, don't fall into the old trap that Bob Seven fell into where it was like, oh, I'm not interested in uh, comics was actually the specific thing. I'm not interested in comics anymore. Uh, they're just not catching me the way they used to. I just don't care about them as much as I do. So I just he just kind of stopped doing them, and he stopped doing anything. And I had to talk to him and be like, dude, come on. You want to go see the movies? Do you want to play such and such a game? And I just kept trying to get him to do stuff so that he could find something else that he found as engaging. He did, by the way, as it happened. <sighs> I actually have that problem too, Kid Viper. Deliberately, but still a problem. <laughs> Volcanto, dude, stop giving away your name. God. No, actually, so what he found interesting was the Resident Evil series. Um, which is another thing worthy of note. Just because a certain video game does not interest you, or even a certain type of video game doesn't interest you, does not mean you can't find another type. There is a huge variety of gaming. Uh, as far as the interactive medium. Just absolutely gargantuan. Uh, tons and tons and tons of different kind of games you can enjoy and, and fun and love and try. It is never, video gaming has never been more accessible than it is right now. <laughs> Do you know how easy it is to be a gamer right now? My niece is a gamer. She's five. <laughs> it's not a joke. Can I share with you guys a real quick, real quick story? Just really off topic. They were doing the uh, Zelda 1... Uh, Reese, I think? God, I actually don't remember, but they were they were playing Zelda 1 uh, for GDQ. And I was like, hey kiddo, and I, I fired up Zelda 1 for her. 
and she played Zelda 1. And she, what's funny is she was having issues with it because Zelda 1's a pretty unforgiving game, let's be honest with that. But when I tried to, when I was like, okay, do you want to move on? She was like, no! Like, she really wanted to keep playing. Um, it's okay, though, because even though the, li the little uh, Octoroks are super dangerous, uh, the jumping guys whose name I can't think of their, what they're called right now, th those are easy. We've got that. We've got that. <laughs> Me too, Blue Wolf Alex. Four or three, I'm not actually sure, but four at the latest. Techites, or Techitites, or whatever, that's the one. <sighs> she got to a dungeon. She's like, oh, okay, what do I go? I need a key. How many keys do I have? And she's, I was teaching her how the UI worked. So you look at the number next to the key, that shows you how many keys you have. You look at the number next to the gems, that shows you how many gems you have, right? Look at the buttons, okay? You see how it says A? What, when you hit A, that's the button that will happen. When you hit B, that's the button that will happen. So she started learning how the UI worked. And she's still a little bit slow on the reflexes, because she, she would like... She would do this, she'd look up the thing and say, okay, A is a sword, stab, 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 stab. And she, also, while she was slicing, she would go, yeah, 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 yeah. And obviously, I can't emulate it because she's the most adorable thing uh, on the planet, but it was very cute. <laughs> I don't have much else to add. Uh, I could do another topic, but this is already an hour and 40 lower week. So, I'm going to go ahead and chop it off. We'll save that other topic for later. So, for those of you on YouTube... Make time. 